Okay, so welcome everyone um, to the Health Studies User Conference 2022. So I'm happy to be chairing the first session again this year. Um, and it's the third year that we've run this online due to COVID. So, um, so we're used to doing it. So hopefully all will go well today and we may return to face-to-face -face next year um, depending on the situation. So we'll see. So on to the programme. So the morning session is 9.45 to 12.45 with a short comfort break for you to stretch your legs. So we're going to have our keynote speaker, Laura Johnson, first up. Um, and that's a 45 minute session, a half hour session, sorry. And then we'll move on to three presentations from Natsen and Ipsos who will give us updates on the cross-sectional surveys. Then after the break, we'll have three further presentations um, to give updates on the longitudinal data. And that will be from the Institute for Social and Economic Research, the Center for Longitudinal Studies and Natsen. And then we'll break for lunch and that will be 45 minute lunch. And then we'll move on to the parallel research paper sessions. So in the afternoon, there are two parallel research paper sessions with a comfort break in between. And then straight after the parallel research sessions, we'll have our final session, which is all about um, using and accessing health studies and training resources. So we have a session on the UK data service and what you can find on our website and YouTube channel to help you use the various health studies. Um, a similar session from Closer uh, about longitudinal studies. Um, there's also a session on data linkage and a session from NHS Digital on data access. So everything you need to know about using data in that session. So please do stay to the end. OK, so just a quick run through, we've got various chairs and facilitators throughout the day. So in the morning, there'll be me and Mary Toom Smith from Natsen, who'll be chairing. And then in the afternoon, we will have three different chairs for each of the parallel sessions. So Jenny Mindell from UCL, Sally McManus from Natsen and me again. And then um, just to let you know that we have three behind the scenes facilitators who are making sure everything runs smoothly throughout the day. Um, so Jill will be doing most of this throughout the day and then in the parallel sessions there will be Jill, Gail Howell and Ali Bloom. So you've got um, back up there if you need it. So we'll move on to Laura's keynote presentation now and she's going to be talking about are we there yet adjusting to the new normal in health research. So I am going to introduce Laura and Laura, if I stop sharing, do you want to get your slides up while I'm introducing you? Yeah, sure. Okay, so as director of the Centre for Health Research, Laura leads a team of 25 researchers using diverse research methods to investigate health and social care, including biomedical surveys and policy evaluation. Laura came to Natsen in 2022 after 10 years at the University of Bristol, where she remains an honorary associate professor in the Department of Population Health Sciences. In addition, she's a visiting researcher in the Cardiovascular Epidemiology Unit at the University of Cambridge. Her research investigates diet disease associations using longitudinal cohorts and the biological, social and psychological factors that influence food intake and appetite control. Laura is a big fan of the UK data service, having used the national diet and nutrition surveys that go back decades, providing a wealth of data to understand variation in the size, frequency, timing and quality of food intake between people within people and over time. Laura also leads work on innovating passive dietary assessment methods, including wearable devices and biomarkers, and is delighted to be sharing her insights on health research as we get used to living with the pandemic. Thank, thank you for coming today and um, over to you. Thanks very much, Vanessa. Um, and thank you everyone for um, logging in and uh, joining us today. What looks like it's going to be a really exciting programme of different talks. Um, so yeah, I'm excited to get started uh, after this one. Um, so yeah, the talk, the title of the talk today is Are We There Yet? And really, it's just kind of the reflection on how it's really easy this year in the last few months to just think, oh, yeah, no, it's post-pandemic now, it's all finished. Um, and uh, should we get back to normal? 
Um, but it's really this talk is meant to be a reflection on um, are we actually going to get back to normal? Are there things that we can do again that we were doing before? And are there things that actually we're never going to do those again because we've learned so much over the last few years? Um, so just to give you a bit of an overview, uh, we're going to, I'm going to be talking about where we are now uh, in terms of the pandemic, um, what just happened uh, in, in relation to uh, health. Do we know what happened to health outside of COVID-19 um, and what happened to health research as well? How did that have to change and adapt? And I'll also at the end um, have a look at uh, what's in store in the future. So uh, have a look at the promise of passive data measurement uh, and some of the work I've been doing on that. So where are we right now? So this is the uh, very helpful uh, timeline uh, from the Active Live survey. And it sort of gives us a reminder of uh, exactly what has been happening over the last two years. It's uh, been a very long two years uh, and it's been featured by uh, three national lockdowns as well as many periods of um, differing levels of restriction. But all restrictions now in the UK at least have been removed. Um, and so you'd be forgiven for believing that um, the pandemic is over. Uh, the latest um, stats on the Office for National Statistics website, however, um, tell a slightly different story. And um, as of yesterday, uh, the rate of infections continues to increase. At the moment, um, hospital admissions are increasing. Thankfully, ICU uh, admissions are staying low and while deaths are increasing, they are still low at the moment as well. About 98% of adults have antibodies suggesting they've either been infected or vaccinated against COVID uh, so far. Um, but perhaps the most concerning um, aspect at the moment is that 3% uh, of the population, so it's 2 million people, uh, have symptoms of long COVID. So that's uh, symptoms beyond four weeks of first infection. Um, so it's a mixed picture uh, in a sense in that uh, infections certainly look bad, but the severity of disease definitely seems to be being controlled by vaccinations. Um, but it's, yeah, normal, not quite yet, I don't think. Um, so, yeah, and uh, the impact of all of this uh, on health research has been huge. And certainly those impacts are still being felt. So what just happened? Um, so we know quite a lot about COVID uh, and um, infections and uh, what's happening there. But a lot of the other standard uh, health markers that we track over time, um, we don't necessarily know as much about those as we'd hoped. The impact of the pandemic on the ability to do health research was massive. So in-person data collection was um, impossible and there are massive gaps in the kind of data that needs in-person data collection uh, from 2020. But there has been a massive adaptation. So there's uh, been a shift to online. There was a real thirst for knowledge in uh, 2020 and um, lots of online surveys uh, were made. There were massive uh, and impressive efforts actually by uh, the longitudinal cohorts to uh, try and harmonise the data that was being collected. But the nature of online data collection means that you have to uh, be short and quick um, and uh, the vast majority of the plethora of surveys that happened in 2020 were um, uh, cross-sectional and uh, convenient samples. So kind of that reliable health data that we're used to having in the UK uh, was really quite compromised. Um, it did offer us an opportunity to test new methods, though, and the feasibility of um, doing online versions of data collection that used to be done in person and having a look to see what uh, the effect of inviting people to nurse visits um, when they're doing the rest of the work online, uh, when you're recruiting people online as well, uh, has been uh, a part of the work that NatSen have been doing with the um, Health Survey for England Feasibility Survey. 
obviously with collaborators. Um, and yeah, so there have been really great opportunities that have been used to understand change. So the main issue with the cross-sectional surveys that have um, uh, that were mainly run uh, throughout 2020 and 2021 is that they don't really tell you about change. So often a lot of the questions that I saw in, in my field of interest where we, I'm looking at what's happening to food intake, the questions were framed around um, people's perceptions of their own change. So did you increase or decrease your snacking, for example, which gives you some information about what might be happening, but it doesn't allow you to actually quantify the change. So you might they might have increased uh, some, but actually how much? Uh, and is it as big of a problem as we think? Um, so really good um, innovation that was made was turning some existing cross-sectional data sets into longitudinal ones so that change could be measured and we could really understand um, what was happening. Um, so uh, one of those data sets was the mental health in children and young people. Um, and that work has been led by Natsen and it's really been the main source of information to understand the impact of the pandemic on mental health in children and young people. Um, and it's not a pretty picture, sadly. Um, so overall, um, many children, uh, found that their mental health as measured by the strengths and difficulties questionnaire declined um, between 2017 and 2021. Um, and that was equated to over half of young people. So it's definitely been felt much greater in that age group. Um, and it means that uh, the number of children with a probable mental disorder is now one in six. And uh, for young people, that's a quarter uh, that have a probable mental disorder. Um, and there's not really been much change between 2020 and 2021. Um, and I think that uh, possibly reflects the timing of the data collection. Um, but we've, because both were during relative, relatively restricted periods, um, but we're eagerly awaiting the results of the next follow up to really understand, is this a temporary thing or will we um, will there be some kind of rebound? Whatever's happening uh, is uh, clearly very difficult. And um, and I think the move to this kind of data collection has really enabled uh, policymakers to kind of look at the issues and think about policies. Um, head on. So a lot of work has been um, commissioned around uh, loneliness and connectedness because that was highlighted as one of the key kind of things that was co-occurring with poor mental health. Um, and so, yeah, that was a key driver of keeping schools open. Um, and there are lots of other uh, initiatives that are being considered as well. Another major um, change that happened in the pandemic was uh, to uh, childhood obesity. Um, so the National Child Measurement Programme uh, managed to get back into schools and make measurements from March 2021. Uh, and uh, when they did, um, there was quite a shock uh, from the data that came back. Um, so this is uh, the graph showing that basically there's been a 5% increase since 2019 in um, the prevalence of overweight and obesity in England. So this data is for reception, um, but you see the same trends mirrored uh, for the year six, and it's pretty similar in boys and girls. <laughs> um, what's even more concerning is the increase in inequalities that's been observed. So specifically, there are much bigger um, changes in the prevalence of, uh, of weight and obesity in um, non-white ethnic groups. And, uh, and if you look at the socioeconomic measures, there's also um, much bigger inequalities emerging from the pandemic there as well. They were already there, of course, and, um, and I think this data just helps to reinforce the importance of having data on um, different ethnic groups uh, and, and informative um, 
ethnic groups specifically. So making sure that there's data on the individual rather than just a whole um, club together uh, group. Uh, so that's, and that's been um, part of then another opportunity that's been uh, taken by researchers is in this time when we can't collect data, actually we can take some time to analyze the data that we've already got. And the Health Survey for England um, have combined data over 10 years so that they could do a comprehensive analysis of um, ethnic differences in health using that data. And the fact that the data had to be combined over 10 years really did emphasise, I think, to government and commissioners that um, existing national surveys really do need um, to boost those um, the recruitment of those different groups so that comparisons, meaningful comparisons can be made. Um, and yeah, that's been a, a positive change. And I know some national surveys that have had some uh, ethnic boosts um, put in, which I think shows that the the pandemic has highlighted um, just with infection rates and and mortality that ethnic groups are more vulnerable, um, and the government really does need to invest in um, research that allows us to properly understand what's happening uh, there. In terms of adults, um, there haven't been in person measures that are published yet um, for adults in terms of obesity. So, uh, but again, one of the opportunities that was used um, with the taking time to reflect um, was the Health Survey for England data on measured and self-reported weights was used to properly understand exactly how to correct self-reported weights um, so that the bias in them, the known bias in them is uh, reduced. So the active lives uh, in adults survey gives us the best indication um, that we can get on the change in adult obesity prevalence. And it's increased by 1%. So uh, there used to be 24% of adults that were obese and uh, up till 2018. And then from the 2019-20 data through to 2021, the increase was 1%. Um, which doesn't sound that much, um, although it does mean that a quarter of adults are obese um, and that's been um, a problem for a long time. But just to put it in context, the last time there was a 1% increase in adult obesity prevalence, it was between uh, 2015 and 2019. So it's equivalent to a previous uh, five year increase all put together. Um, so we've definitely got a problem. We already had a problem with obesity in this country and, uh, and it's just got a lot worse. Um, so we need to redouble efforts to implement policies um, and uh, yeah, really understand what's happening so that uh, interventions to help people prevent obesity and to also treat obesity um, can properly work. So there's a lot about the kind of behaviours that might underpin obesity that uh, sort of raise questions in my mind. Um, what, what was happening there? Is it that there was a decrease in physical activity? And certainly there is there's some evidence of that uh, from self-reported data. Um, there's also a small number of studies that have been done using objectively measured physical activity, um, looking at individual change. Um, that again indicate that uh, physical activity declined, although perhaps not as much as one might think, um, maybe sort of five minutes when you measure it objectively um, in terms of moderate to vigorous, but there has been quite an increase in sedentary time and screen time equivalent to about 20 or 30 minutes a day. But you kind of have to piece these um, bits of research together because there isn't any kind of nationally representative data set that tells us. Um, and that's kind of uh, one of the reasons why I think uh, investing in passive measurement is something that we really need to uh, think about doing more of. So this is data from uh, the Office for National Statistics, and it tells us a bit about mobility. Um, which is one aspect of possibly of physical activity in terms of moving around. Um, but it's 
uh, an example of how there's data that's being collected on phones all the time that can be repurposed in an anonymized way to understand how um, movements are changing. So this tells us about kind of visits to different locations on a map. Um, but I remember early in the pandemic um, that there were publications coming out from Fitbit um, using the wealth of data that they had there to understand kind of how physical activity as measured by um, a wearable device like Fitbit um, changed uh, at the onset of the pandemic. And you could see that, you know, with the imposition of lockdown restrictions in many countries, there was a massive decline in physical activity during lockdowns. Um, and it's interesting to consider kind of how much that's maintained um, beyond that once restrictions are released, do we all kind of bounce back or not? Um, some data from uh, Bristol suggests perhaps not so much uh, yet, but um, the key thing here is that the Fitbit data is available um, to people that own Fitbits. And that's not, it's nowhere near representative of the population. And so there are massive gaps in terms of understanding health behaviours at the moment that exist in um, really kind of harnessing the power of passive measurement. But I think that that example of using it showed that almost within a few weeks that data was published and we knew exactly what was happening. And, you know, there was clear policies around allowing physical activity in the UK that I think were kind of driven by that concern of the impact on physical activity. So in terms of um, thinking about can we passively measure dietary intake, um, because that would be useful for many different reasons, not least because um, it would have helped us really understand what happened um, during the pandemic and what continues to happen and, and how change is occurring. Um, so I've been researching kind of different options for thinking about how to passively measure food intake. And there's definitely an option of um, building in algorithms for wrist-worn uh, devices, either smartwatches or, or known research devices like Activity, where you can um, detect the specific movement of eating um, with the rotation and the movement of the wrist. But there's a lot that you don't get. Just you, you may be able to identify that someone's eating there, but you won't know what they're eating. Um, and actually, the vast majority of the, <laughs> the impacts on health is about what people are eating, not necessarily when or how often. Although understanding that is definitely a good start. So the only way you could probably really passively measure diet is if you combine lots of different sensors. So um, in this particular uh, figure, which is in a paper that I published um, in 2020, uh, led by Andy Skinner at the University of Bristol. Um, so here you can see the integration of lots of different sensors like a wrist worn uh, device, um, a wearable camera that we think if you could just activate that when someone was detecting eating, that could um, help make that a more feasible method, avoiding the kind of privacy concerns and also the battery problems of having a camera taking photos like all the time. Um, here you've got um, skin based sensors that can look at kind of the, the chemical composition of, of epithelial substance and then also sensors that can go on uh, teeth that uh, give us an idea of um, the types of macronutrients that are being eaten. Um, and there's lots of potential with wearable sensors now to uh, get a, a sense of um, what the what food intake might be um, but there's lots of work to be done um, and yeah, so that's where I think we should be investing money is, is really in thinking how do we integrate all of these technologies and how do we bring them together to properly get an understanding of um, what people are eating over time. Because um, I think that would really help us plug some of the gaps um, that uh, happened uh, in terms of understanding diet during the pandemic. Um, so, yeah, that's uh, all I have to say for now. I hope you all have a good day. So as Vanessa said, the first half of the day is going to be updates on what has been going on on various um, cross-sectional and longitudinal health-related studies. Um, there's been quite a lot of 
change, development, innovation uh, on many of them. So we'll have some very interesting presentations uh, in store. Um, so the first session is about cross-sectional studies. We have three presentations here and um, there is going to be uh, about five minutes for questions after each of the presentations. So please type in your questions um, as, as we go along. The first presenter is uh, Anne Connolly from Natsen, and she's talking about the major health service during the second year of the pandemic. Hi, Anne. Um, so Anne is a research director um, at Natsen, and she specialises in the delivery of complex large-scale health surveys with particular expertise in biosocial data collection methods. So over to you, Anne. Thanks, Mari. Great. So as Mari said, Natsen carries out many population health surveys. And the aim of this presentation is to give an overview of how they've adapted to the pandemic over the last couple of years and where we are now. So I'm going to talk about the surveys that you can see on the screen now. For each one, I'll give an overview of the methods and the content and then update on the latest surveys, data and reports. I'm not going to include any findings in this presentation or not many um, because there's not much time. Um, but I will uh, link to reports and websites uh, where applicable. Okay, so starting off with the Health Survey for England. The Health Survey for England, or HSE, is a nationally representative survey based on a random sample of households in England. It's a health examination survey, meaning that we collect both self-reported data from participants directly, but also we take physical measurements and biological data. Data is collected annually and it's been running for over 30 years now, and this enables us to monitor trends, of the <coughs> trends over time. It's a cross-sectional survey, so we take a fresh sample of participants each year with around 8,000 adults and 2,000 child participants annually. The study is commissioned by NHS Digital and it's carried out by a collaborative team at Natsen and UCL. So this slide shows the core content of the interviewer and nurse stages of the Health Survey for England. And it has various topics around health and health related behaviours. These aren't all asked every year, but they will rotate and be asked regularly. And we also have additional content, <clears throat> and this slide just shows some, some of the recent additional content where people have commissioned specific modules on particular topics. <clears throat> so going back to HSE 2020, um, when the pandemic hit, all in-home interviewing and nurse field work was um, suspended as we weren't allowed to go into people's homes and it didn't resume for HSE 2020. Um, we will archive the quarter one data in due course, um, but as Laura mentioned, we used this opportunity to do some reporting of existing HSE data. Um, so Laura already mentioned, we published a report recently about um, health and ethnicity. And in order to do this, we combined nine years of HSE data to make sure that we could look at specific ethnic groups without having to sort of lump together black and Asian and white just as, as <clears throat> big groups. We had um, more granularity to look at smaller ethnic groups. And we do also plan to deposit that data with UKDS. We're also doing this piece of work looking at self-reported height and weight data, which has known um, self-reporting bias and our measured height and weight data, um, and so that we can establish ways of correcting for um, bias in self-reports. And that, that report will be published at some point this year. Laura also mentioned our HSE feasibility study that was carried out in late 2020 and early 21. And this was designed to test the suitability of transferring some key health survey content from the usual face-to-face -face interviewing to self-completion -comple mode. So an online survey and a paper questionnaire for people who didn't complete online. The report from this study was published in November of last year. 
Um, and I can't go into all the findings, but just very briefly, we did discover much lower response rates, both overall to the survey, but also to individual elements within the survey, like consent to data linkage, consent for a follow-up nurse visit, and so on. We found that the sample of participants who responded to the feasibility study contained bias. So participants tended to be older, more likely to be from a white background, more likely to live in affluent areas and so on. And when we looked at the actual health survey estimates, we noticed that the feasibility study participants were less likely to have long-standing health conditions, less likely to smoke, less likely to eat fire, fruit and veg day. So we think we were getting a, a healthier group of people responding. And we also found that many of the health survey questions that were designed as interviewer-led questions just weren't suitable for self-completion modes and couldn't be included. On to HSE 2021. Um, so back at the start of last year, we still weren't able to go into people's homes, but we adapted a fieldwork model whereby we wrote to people a random sample of, of households and asked them to contact us with their contact details so that we could administer a telephone interview. By April, as restrictions started to ease, we changed this model to doing doorstep recruitment. So again, a random sample of participants, but our interviewers would go and make that doorstep contact where we have much more success at engaging participants and um, them agreeing to participate. However, the actual interviewing was still conducted by telephone. To facilitate this, we had to reduce the content of the interview significantly, so down to about half an hour, whereas usually it's about an hour. And of course, the nurse visits have to be face to face. So these won't be introduced until October 2021. Because of some of these changes, we've had to extend the um, 2021 field work. So it's running, it ran till April 2022 for the interview stage and June of this year for the nurse stage. And we'll, we're due to publish reports later this year and early next year with data available the following, yeah, with data available next year. And then finally on HSC, we had a return to in-home interviewing at the start of this year. Um, we still have a backup option of telephone interviewing where participants are uncomfortable or unable to participate face-to-face. But we're finding that the majority of field work is now taking place in home. Okay, that's HSE. So on to the next one, Scottish Health Survey. The Scottish Health Survey, like the Health Survey for England, is a national survey that is designed to be representative of people in Scotland. It was first carried out back in 1995 and then intermittently for a few years before it was began being conducted annually from 2008 onwards. It's commissioned by Scottish Government and it's carried out by our colleagues in Scotsen, ONS and um, academic collaborators um, who you can see their logos on this slide, a whole range of academics. And the study is designed to estimate, analyse, compare and monitor health and health behaviours in Scotland. This is the content of the Scottish Health Survey. So these are the 2022 modules. And these are modules that are asked every other year, but aren't in the 2022 survey. So it covers a wide range of, of topics. And the survey process for shares in, in normal times would be the interviewer contacting sampled addresses, once someone agrees to participate, there's a household questionnaire that establishes the composition of the household and collects some household level data. Then there's individual questionnaires for up to 10 adults per household and up to two children per household. Um, and each respondent is asked questions about aspects of their lifestyle that might affect their health. They're also asked to complete a paper questionnaire um, and Participants aged two and older have their height and weight measured. Um, and we also ask their permission to be contacted for follow-up research in the future. So what's going on with SHARES 2022? 
Um, the Scottish government were a bit less, they were a bit stricter about um, letting researchers go back into participants' homes. So face-to-face -face field work um, only started in, in May of this year. Field work began in, 20, in March um, with a similar approach to the health survey where interviewers would go to people's doorstep, recruit, but carry out telephone interviewing. And then from May onwards, um, we've been in home with a telephone contingency. Because of the switch to telephone interviewing, it meant administering paper questionnaires was much more difficult. So we created online self-completion options and we'll carry that forward even with the return to in-home interviewing um, as, a, as an option. So there's an error here. Height and weight measurements returned in May 2022, not 2019. And the full biological module that includes waste measurements, blood pressure and saliva um, is, return, is to return from next month. Scottish Health Survey reports. So going back to 2019, when we did face-to-face -face data collection as usual, that report is available online. In 2020, they carried out telephone interviewing but with prior Scottish Health Survey participants and that's been published as experimental statistics. Um, then there's a forthcoming report from the 2021 survey where they did um, telephone interviewing but with a fresh sample and doorstep recruitment to be published later this year and of course SHES 2022 is a bit down the road um, in late 23. Next up is MHCYP. So this is a major surveys series of the mental health of children and young people in England, which Laura mentioned in her presentation. So the first three iterations of this study were carried out in 1999, 2004, and then in 2017. And it's a probability sample of children and young people living in England who are registered with a GP. The 2017 data were collected from or about two to 19 year olds, and it included over 9,000 children and young people. And so data were collected from children and young people directly where they're old enough, from parents and from teachers. And the data were analyzed by clinical raters um, and again, this study was commissioned by NHS Digital and conducted by a collaboration between NATSEN, ONS and academic collaborators at the University of Cambridge and the University of Exeter. And as Laura mentioned, in 2020, we carried out this follow-up study of the previous 2017 MHCYP participants who had agreed to be recontacted. And the aim of this was to measure mental health and well-being of children young people in England and to understand how they'd been affected by the pandemic. It involved a 20 minute web survey and for people who didn't participate in the web survey we phoned them to give them a little gentle nudge to try and encourage participation and this report was published uh, back in September 2020 and as you've already seen it found that rates of probable mental disorder using the SDQ had increased from one in nine children and young people in 2017 to one in six children and young people in 2020. And that was using the same measure of mental disorder, but as Laura mentioned, different um, methodology in terms of face-to-face -face data collection versus um, an online survey. We then did a second follow-up um, of the same cohort of participants. Um, the second follow-up, there was two options, either a web or a telephone survey with the same aims. And again, as Laura mentioned, we found that at this point, the rates of probable mental disorder had stabilized between 2020 and 21. And then we did a third follow-up study, again, of the same cohort. By now, those children and young people that were aged two to 19 are now aged between seven and 24. Uh, it was another 20 minute web survey with similar aims, but also expanded to include some other issues that we know were affecting children and young people, particularly loneliness and disordered eating. Um, 
sorry, just quickly, the report for that won't be published until November of this year, so watch this space. Um, and this slide shows the content of that third follow-up study. So there's loads of really interesting data that will be um, published on that. Okay, moving on to the National Diet and Nutrition Survey. So NDNS, this is a cross-sectional survey of diet and nutrition. It provides the only source of high quality nationally representative data on the types and quantities of food consumed by individuals. Um, and we use that to estimate nutrient intake for the population. It, the survey runs continuously every year and we aim to interview a thousand people, 500 adults and 500 children annually. So for the first 11 years of this study, dietary data was collected using a food diary, an, an unweighed four-day food diary. But since year 12, uh, which started in 2019, the dietary data has been obtained using an online dietary recall tool. So individuals are asked to complete four 24-hour recalls <clears throat> over a two to two to seven weeks following the interview. Um, so there's also information collected by an interviewer and during a nurse visit, including physical measurements and biological samples. Uh, the core funders of NDNS are the Office for Health Improvement and Disparities, or what used to be known as PHE, um, and the Food Standards Agency. And that's in work in partnership with MRC Epidemiology Unit at the University of Cambridge and also NISRA carry out the field work in Northern Ireland. So what can you find in the data? Um, there's quite a lot of different data files from NDNS. They're grouped as follows. So we have household data that contains information on household com composition, demographics. Um, there's individual data that contains interview data, self-completion questionnaire data, physical measurements, biological sample analytes, um, and so on. And then we've got dietary level data. And this, this is actually in three different levels. So we've got person level data. We've then got day level data, which is daily food consumption, and then a food level data file that has nutrient data at the food level. And then finally, there's this other UK Nutrients Data Bank, where um, nutrient information is provided per 100 gram of food. So an update on where NDNS is. The latest report was published back in 2020 and includes analyses of the first 11 years of the programme, so loads of interesting trend data in there. Um, year 12 of the study was paused in March 2020 and it didn't resume. Year 13 of the study was also paused due to the pandemic, but inter interview field work resumed in October of that year. And then year 14 launched as planned, um, but has had needed a field work extension to October of this year. Uh, I just wanted also to mention the diet, nutrition and activity during COVID study. So this was a piece of work we did during lockdown where we recontacted participants from previous NDNS study, um, surveys and got them to complete an online survey um, and that data was published back in September 21. Just a quick um, bit on how we adapted NDNS. So because of the pandemic, remote interviewing protocols were introduced um, so, that part, so that households could still take part either if they weren't comfortable with face-to-face -face interviewing or at the time, the current restrictions prevented in home interviewing completely. In the end, all of year 13 interviewing took place by telephone. And when we did this telephone interviewing, we had to adapt the protocol for participants completing their dietary recall. Before COVID, interviewers would be in the home and they would support them through the completion of the first dietary recall, which is quite involved. Whereas once we switched to telephone, participants needed to do their first recall independently. Um, interviewers would phone back either later the same day or the next day to see how they got on and to give them any support if necessary. Um, <clears throat> and we also offered the option of participants phoning 
interviewers to go through it with them over the phone. Um, but only those who were able to do it independently were then invited to do the three subsequent recalls in the weeks that followed. We had to make other adaptations, so height and weight became self-reported. We had no biological samples. And then we had to um, create some socially distanced doorstep protocols for a couple of sub-studies. I'm not going to go into the sub-studies, but we have a, a doubly labelled water sub-study and a physical activity monitor sub-study, uh, which also needed adaptation. And then year 14 field work, it began just with the telephone only model, but then in-home interviewing was reintroduced in September 21 and nurse field work in November 21. Um, and they're ongoing. There's still the telephone option available when necessary. NDNS. Uh, so last but not least is the National Surveys of Sexual Attitudes and Lifestyles on NATSAL. Um, so NATSAL is Britain's National Probability Sample Survey of Sexual Health and it's taken place every 10 years since 1990 and to date um, has interviewed over 45,000 people living in Britain and spans people born from the early 30s through to the start of the 21st century. So NATSAL was initiated in the mid 80s in response to the emergence of HIV and the realization of a need for robust epidemiological data on sexual risk behaviors for HIV that didn't exist. But over the years, it has evolved with each round to take a broader perspective on sexual health so initially considering STIs more broadly than just HIV in the second that cell. And then considering sexual health in its broadest content, content oh, broadest content takes, sorry, <laughs> since in that cell three. And that cell four, which will be commencing in a couple of months' time and will run through next year, will continue to adopt this broader perspective of sexual health. But also considering sex and sexual health in Britain in 2022, major societal shifts that we've seen over the past decade, including greater recognition of gender fluidity and diversity more generally. But at the heart of that cell is really its unique ability to provide population perspective in the jigsaw of evidence that's needed to design and evaluate sexual health services and interventions. So like many of our studies, NATSAL 4 got derailed a bit by COVID. Um, the development work actually started back in 2019 and into 2020. And the intention was to pilot face-to-face -face field work in early 2020, but that got postponed. Uh, we then adapted the methodology to enable remote data collection, including remote biological sampling and data linkage consents and various aspects of the study. And we eventually piloted in June to August 2021, initially, um, with a mixture of face-to-face, -face, telephone and video interviewing, and then a second pilot in early 2022 with face-to-face -face and telephone interviewing. Um, and the main stage is due to start um, in September of this year. I also just quickly wanted to mention the NATSAL COVID study, which isn't um, NATSAL aren't involved in, but the wider NATSAL team got very busy at the start of the pandemic and um, set up a rapid quota sample web panel surveys, which were designed to understand the impact of COVID on the nation's sexual and reproductive health. And they did an initial wave in the summer of 2020 and a second wave in spring 2022. Um, it contains loads of really interesting data about sexual behaviours, reproductive health, sexual health services, um, relationships, intimate partner violence. Um, and the Wave 1 data is already available on UKDS website with Wave 2 to be deposited shortly. So if you want any more information on any of the studies that I've talked about today, I've put the lead um, 
research directors' names on this slide, um, and I'm sure they'd be happy to answer more detailed questions. Um, but that's it from me, a whistle stop tour of our cross sectionals. Thank you very much, Anne. So we have next presentation is from uh, Katie Rido and uh, from Natsen, and Katie will present about the the preparations for the next adult psychiatric morbidity survey or APMS. Uh, Katie is a senior researcher at Natsen in the health and biomedical service team and has worked on a number of large scale population health surveys such as the Health Survey of England and is currently working on the APMS. So Katie, over to you. Thank you, just share my screen. There we go, hopefully everyone can see that. Is that okay? Um, so hi, so yeah, so I'm gonna talk about um, us designing the, the next adult psychiatric morbidity survey. Um, so a little bit of background about sort of the survey series and then just a sort of an overview of um, the development work that we've been doing for the 2023 survey as well. So APMS is the um, longest running mental health survey um, con using consistent methods. Um, and this is, we've been running it since 1993 and it's been running sort of more or less um, every seven years. Um, and the last one that was run was in um, 20, 2014. And the next one that we'll be running is in uh, 2023. So this is the one that we're currently um, in development for. So there have been other mental health surveys that are conducted on sort of more specific um, populations at certain times as well. So there's been some that have been conducted um, sort of on homelessness um, and those within institutions as well. Um, but for APMS, we have mostly it's been this one, it's been carried out um, within sort of a population level um, going through and not necessarily within um, those levels of institutions. But for the 2023 survey, we are using a um, more specific population group within our sampling as well. So we're also going to be looking at deprived areas um, and ethnic minority um, groups as well. So the main aims of sort of the, the, the survey series um, in general is um, to be able to look at the prevalence of mental health conditions. So we asked lots um, of questions about different mental health conditions and it's finding out the population and prevalence for this. So it's a really important data source um, to be able to look into this. Where we've been conducting it since um, 1993 as well, we've been able to look at these changes over time. Um, so we can look to see how any of these uh, have been changing. We also allows us to look at some of the um, inequalities and in prevalence as well from the extra um, information that we collect. And where we look at um, things in terms of sort of support and treatment that people have been using, um, we can find out the extent that people um, use those and have that support. And also we can look into those inequalities so we can use this data source to see where those sort of needs, um, th those needs are. And where the, we have um, so much information around sort of um, individuals the lifestyles, we can really have context um, onto some of these um, mental health conditions as well. And where we're con collecting information about more than one mental health condition, we can look into some of those comorbidities and see um, potentially where um, they lie. So for the 2023 survey, so this is the one we're in development stage, the development stage of. Obviously, as you can see here, it takes a quite a long process um, in terms of the from starting um, to when we actually go into field. So we started our development um, sort of in April, March time um, in 2021. And first of all, we started off sort of with a consultation, um, which is talking to sort of stakeholders to really find out how this survey is used um, and what was really important to include um, on the survey this year. And from these consultations, we then um, took this into account and went into sort of developing the questionnaires and the content um, to understand what we needed to include. So we first of all carried out some cognitive testing as well. Um, so for any of the new content we added in, just to make sure that we were asking questions that um, people understood and that we were really capturing the correct content um, as well. And then from that, we went on um, and have been developing um, the dress rehearsal. So we did a run of um, a trial run of the, uh, the main stage to then see um, so we could look at any changes that we needed to make. And that's where we currently are. So we've just run our dress rehearsals um, and we're looking at um, the findings from those and seeing potentially where we need to make those changes um, and adapt it. And then for um, the main stage, we're hoping to be starting that um, in September um, and that's, that, the fieldwork will run for um, about a year. 
So APMS, um, so infield, is actually known as the National Study of Health and Wellbeing. So we use a slightly different name, um, but we use a probability sample of um, private households in England. So this allows us to um, get ask questions from participants that aren't just in contact with um, the health services as well, which is really important, especially when we're looking at those um, participants who, and we're looking at sort of those who are using healthcare um, or those who aren't using healthcare services as well. So it's a cross-sectional um, survey and we ask of those adults age um, 16 plus um, and we have it as a two-stage um, design. So we have the first stage which um, we go into participants homes and ask them questions um, with an interviewer and then we have a second stage um, interview which is a more clinical assessment um, and sort of validates the phase one um, interviews as well and that's conducted with sort of a subsample of participants. And it's funded by the Department of Health and Social Care um, and NH NHS Digital. So a bit more information about sort of how we have been designing the 2023 survey and what's been going on um, in terms of what we're going to be doing. So as normal as most years, we're going to be having our um, core sample of participants that we're going to be recruiting um, through um, private households that we're going to be randomly selecting. Now, this year, we've actually been having a focus, as I said, about um, those for deprived areas um, and for ethnic minority groups as well. So we're having a boost in our samples for this. Um, and because of this, we've decided that we've designed it. So we're actually going to be um, conducting the survey with two separate samples. So we have our core sample, which is combined with the boost of um, deprived areas um, and our ethnic minority group boost as well. So we decided um, to have the deprived area boost as it was um, taken into um, consideration and it was sort of really important and um, to have an extra um, understanding of those areas and sort of the mental health um, within those areas and mental health is often found to be a lot higher within um, more deprived areas so it means that for analysis wise we can really look into the certain mental health conditions um, to, to a further extent as well. For the ethnic minority groups, um, we are in this sample, we're really interested um, in looking, we've been looking at previous um, data to, to identify the groups um, that for mental health data, and um, we really wanted to sort of um, have a further um, sample of. So for the ethnic minority groups, and um, we're looking and we're sampling um, more individuals from those areas from from groups from the Black African and um, Black Caribbean, uh, Black Mixed, Indian, Pakistani and Bangladeshi backgrounds. So we're going to be including and increasing um, that sample size. So the sample overall is a lot higher than it has been in previous years. And even for the core sample, we've been increasing that, um, the sample size. So overall, we have um, we're hoping to sample sort of 8,000 for the core sample, um, and we're going to have about 739 um, in those deprived areas, um, and 3,000 for the ethnic minority boost. So we're really increasing those samples, which has meant in terms of the development work we've had to do, um, we've had to do a lot of work around um, how we've, we're, we're running the survey. So in terms of the fieldwork process, um, this sort of outlines uh, how we uh, contact and how the, the fieldwork runs. So we send out advanced letters to participants, so those that we've, um, we've selected, and then an interviewer will make contact with those participants um, and will carry out an adult selection. So we only have one adult um, from each household that is taken part, taking part, um, so they'll have to carry out that selection. And then if they agree, they'll have um, an interview. Um, and this interview is carried out um, in, in face, face to face at the moment. Um, and it's carried out with an interviewer um, asking them questions. And it also has a self-completion um, element to it as well. Now, the interview is normally supposed to take about 90 minutes. Um, but for some individuals, obviously, it can take slightly longer depending on um, their sort of uh, their conditions that they might have as well and their, their experiences. And it is quite a sensitive um, topic, so it's really a lot of thought has to go into how these interviews are carried out um, and how sort of the timing of those interviews are um, to really understand sort of to reduce that burden um, from participants as well. So we try and do it so that we um, adapt the interview and so we make it so it's structured in a way that um, as it tails off to the end, it becomes less sensitive and it's asked questions more about sort of their, um, their life and sort of their social media use and, and things like that. And we also ask them at the end if they consent to being contacted um, to be able to carry out the phase two um, field work as well. 
And this year we're going to be asking um, for data linkage consent so we can link up data um, to their other records. Um, but that's still under discussions in terms of what data sources um, we will we'll be linking up with. So this outlines the proposed content for 2023. Um, so when we have, there's, there's a lot of content um, that we cover. And this is the decision of what kind of goes in. There's a lot of thought that goes into um, what needs to be included. As it's a really high in high, um, demand um, data source, um, there's a lot of really important um, information that we want to be included in this. So after looking at sort of the previous content that's been included and having after the consultations, this is the proposed content that we had um, for, for the dress rehearsal. Now, a lot of this um, is the same that's been included in previous years. This is so we can continue to have those and monitor those trends um, that we've had um, on previous years. Obviously, where we've added in some modules, which um, are some of the ones that are um, in red, we've also had to um, remove a couple of modules as well but this year some of the main ones that we've included are um, sort of problem gambling um, and, and self-reported height and weight as well now the interviews as I said um, earlier is about 90 minutes um, in length as the length we hope it to be um, but because from the dress rehearsal we'd actually find that it was um, slightly longer than that so some of this content will potentially be removed um, for for the main stage so in terms of the phase two survey, so they have their phase one um, interview and then we have um, the phase two survey. Um, now, this is conducted by uh, the University of Leicester and they're specially trained um, interviewers. Um, and this follows a more clinical sort of assessment um, of the interview. And the idea of it is to be able to to validate some of the um, and assess some of the serious mental health conditions. So for say phase two, um, it's the subsample. So we have about 700 um, of the core sample is taken, about 65 um, from the deprived areas um, sample and 263 from the ethnic minority boost sample. And we're also sampling those who screen um, for an eating disorder as well. So we're taking about 150 and sampling for those within um, phase two. Now, phase two um, covers psychosis, um, autism, ADHD um, and eating disorders this year. So eating disorders um, is a new um, sub, uh, content that's going to be in for, for phase two. And it's a really interesting um, section of, it, of, of, the, of the interview. So some of the content are the priority areas that have been added in for this year. So um, one of them is eating disorders. So there's been um, a real interest um, from the Department of Health and Social Care around eating disorders, where there's been an increase in uh, referrals for eating disorders um, in England. Now, we really want to understand um, if this is because of the, we really want to understand the current um, prevalence of eating disorders. So we really want to know whether or not this uptake in eating disorders is from um, those who there's a high prevalence of the eating disorders or if it's just that there's sort of better access to, to care um, and, and services or there's just more understanding and knowledge about where those services are. So in previous years we've had um, SCOF included um, within the um, within APMS but this um, doesn't really provide um, an understanding of prevalence of levels of, of eating disorders. It only really provides um, an understanding of possible eating, dis eating problems and it, it only um, contains sort of five items um, in, in this um, assessment. So within the 2023 survey we have um, additionally added in the um, eating disorders um, examination questionnaire as well and we've got the, the short questionnaire so for those who screen um, po positive for possible so um, eating disorder with the scoff scale we then ask them some more questions um, on the eating disorder examination um, scale as well and then we've also included this um, eating disorders within phase two so we've um we're developing a scan um, ED, so an eating disorders scan. So this is um, going to be used to validate um, those uh, those who have screened positive um, within uh, for having an eating disorder within phase one. So it's a really exciting piece um, of work that's going on um, for Leicester in the phase two um, section of it as well. So the scan has been um, is supporting the DSM five um, and ICD eleven as well. And when you really need to, it's been tested to make sure um, that it's been validated against sort of NHS um, clinical diagnosis as well.
So they've been carrying out validation studies to make sure that that is there um, and comparing this um, between those um, who have been diagnosed from NHS um, patients as well. Um, and obviously looking at those who haven't to make sure that it is picking up um, the correct uh, diagnoses. So another um, area that has been of real interest this year is gambling um, that has been seen as something that we've been wanted to add in. Um, the last time gambling was included um, was in 2007 on APMS, and this was using the DSM questions. So where there was this need um, to, to ask these questions and this real um, interest around gambling, we've, we've added those in. But where when we were looking at um, the questions to include, instead of DSM um, questions, we're actually in, instead including the problem gambling and severity index. Now, this is partly because if we were using DSM, we need to update the questions anyway, um, and that would be to the DSM-5, which would mean that we wouldn't really have that comparability between the previous years um, anyway. And the PGSI is, is better at um, looking and looks at focuses on specific harms associated with gambling um, rather than the DSM-5, which um, really looks at um, diagnosis of, of gambling. Um, gambling problems. So this allows us to identify people who are at potential risk um, of related harm as well. And it also has been is asked on other surveys such as HSE um, and shares as well, and is um, a scale that's used more internationally. Um, so hopefully we can then it can be compared um, between um, other surveys as well. And we've also added in a few questions on sort of treatment use um, for gambling as well to see whether or not um, and who has been using uh, those services. So a really important uh, and really interesting and part of um, the development of APMS has been us including um, the ethnic minority boost. So it's really important that APMS is um, representative of the diverse communities uh, across the country. Um, and as you may have seen earlier, the last time um, we had a focus on the ethnic minority boosts um, for mental health um, groups was actually in 2000. So it's been a really long time since we've managed to collect any of that data. So there's a really urgent need to have this sort of data updated. In previous um, studies where we use the random selection um, of addresses, um, this has meant that we, we don't actually um, collect enough um, information and have enough uh, people taking part from certain ethnic minority um, backgrounds um, to be able to, uh, to go into more detail about these groups and their mental health as well. So to carry out um, the, the analysis on, on those. Even if we take data from sort of two or three years of the surveys together, we still don't have enough to be able to sample and um, to carry out those analyses. So it's really important that we have got this right and that we um, are increasing and making sure that we do have um, those take people taking part. So this year we have been, where we've been um, including the ethnic boost, we've really been developing and trying to work at how we can um, implement this in, in the best way possible. So we've been reviewing um, sort of previous surveys that have included boosts, particularly sort of ethnic um, boosts as well. So surveys such as Evans and Selco and Imperic, and just looking at sort of the processes that have involved um, and, and how they've carried those out and how, what we can apply um, in terms of for us as well. And we also looked at reviewing the content from our questionnaire and also those questionnaires, uh, the previous questionnaires, um, to see what content we can sort of adapt to make sure that the questions we're asking are um, they're relevant and inclusive to, to everyone that we're asking them for as well. And after going through and looking at this, we have made some changes and adaptions to some of the questions such as sort of religion, um, the discrimination and um, ethnicity and migration modules as well. So we've updated these so that they're really capturing the information um, that we need to to these communities. We've also had a really exciting piece of work in terms of sort of trying to work out how we um, are increasing that participant engagement. Obviously, we are sampling these participants, but the really key thing is that they, they take part as well. So we've been really focusing um, and we've been talking to um, an immersive um, change agency as well and working with them in terms of how we can best get that message um, across and really um, how we can best carry out this research. So one thing that we um, did as well was 
change of the sort of the naming of um, and framing of it. So instead of the ethnic minority boost, um, we were calling it representing um, ethnic minority groups to really get across to interviewers and to, to participants as well, um, sort of the importance of, of this um, part of the survey um, and, and what impact um, this part of the survey is as well. So the sample design and um, we have uh, for this, we are uh, sampling random addresses as we do for the core, but we are taking this from areas where there uh, is a higher percentage of ethnic um, density, um, so higher ethnic density areas. So we've been using the census data to help us identify that as well. Um, so for the first quarter, we're going to be using uh, the 2011 census um, to be able to find out um, areas where we have those higher um, those that higher percentage um, and then hopefully for the further quarters we'll be able to use the sort of most recent um, census data to then be able to have a more accurate um, analysis of that. So for the um, where we're sampling these areas when we go to those participants households obviously potentially although it's a higher proportion uh, of those in that area there's still potential that no one in that household will be living um, living there belonging to any of the groups um, that we are selecting. So we are going to be carrying out um, a screening process to understand um, eligibility of that household. And we're hoping um, of, of achieving sort of 500 um, interviews with each of the, um, the selected groups. So where we're having this uh, screening section um, to start off, we've actually decided to um, split this into two um, phases. So we're having um, a screening phase and an interviewing phase. Now, this is a really new piece of work that we are doing. So we're really looking into how we can carry out this, um, this, this in a really um, appropriate way and in a way that um, we can get the most engagement out of it as well. So we're, there's a lot of um, participants that we're having to go, um, households we have to go to for the screening process. Um, we've actually decided to um, have um, a specialist screening panel that we're recruiting separately as well. Now this allows us to look into sort of developing how we can um, best carry this out. So one thing we um, have been looking into is trying to make sure that we are including people from those communities um, within um, the screening panel as well. And um, just to try and have that, so when they're making contact, we have the um, familiar familiarity and hopefully um, the understanding um, and sort of they can in, really get across the idea of the importance of the research as well. And we're going to be training these participants as well. And we've been using um, another um, agency as well to help us with that. And in terms of sort of the, how they're selling the, the, um, the interview on the doorstep um, and just how they're approaching it as well. And we're also going to be um, providing translations for the interviews. Um, so we're going to be pre providing um, translations in Urdu as well. So that hopefully um, for some of those participants that we otherwise wouldn't be able to take an interview with because um, they don't speak um, English, we can then uh, capture them within this as well. As I say, we now have, have just finished um, the Ethnic Minority Boost um, dress rehearsal. So we are really in the stage of looking into what we can learn from, um, from, from that, that, that stage of the survey and how we can apply this um, for, for the main stage. So we had some really positive feedback um, from the dress rehearsal, which was um, really promising. Um, and they really especially um, liked the, having the, the splits between um, the screening and, and the interviewing stage as well. And they thought that that worked really well. But this is just some of the key things that we um, came out that we need to consider and that we're going to try and develop um, further to then try and improve for the main stage. So one of the things um, was the, the interview was too long, so it was found that it was a lot longer than 90 minutes. So we really need to reduce um, the level of that content. Whereas it is a very sensitive interview, obviously that is quite burdensome particip for participants if that is, um, that is quite long. The ability um, to reallocate interviews to different interviewers. Um, so this was something that came up within certain communities where a female um, was the adult who was selected and it was felt that um, they weren't comfortable with a male interviewer taking part, um, taking part in the interview. So we really need to have the um, ability to be able to reallocate um, to a female part, um, interviewer if, if that need is there as well. Now for having a follow-up letter between the screening and the interviewing stage. So we had 
um, where we had the two stages, there wasn't any contact really between those two stages. So had providing them with a letter um, between those stages to then for them to sort of as a reminder of, of the research was felt to be something that was quite um, important as well. There was also um, the they found it that within some households it was quite hard to um, have difficulty accessing sort of buildings, especially where there was sort of telecoms that weren't working um, and how so they couldn't actually make any contact. So we're really looking into how we can um, we can we can get around this as well, especially within the areas um, within the ethnic minority beast areas and there's potentially um, and the deprived areas as well. This is potentially going to impact the survey a little bit more than it would. Um, otherwise as well. And we really want to try and define a little bit more the black mixed um, group definition as well to really um, get a better definition and sort of understanding of what we are sampling for um, so that we can define this um, better to, to participants as well. And some of the interviewers, um, we really sort of found out where it is quite a sensitive um, interview, we really do need to try and provide sort of support for interviewers as well um, in terms of how they can handle um, handle those interviews. So we have um, the previous versions of um, the, the report and the last version of the report was 2014, um, is available um, to, to have a look at um, on NHS Digital's website as well. Um, but yes, we are in the sort of developing stage um, for the main stage and hopefully um, we can start carrying that out um, in September. All right, um, thank you very much, Katie. And we're now going to move on to um, Eileen Irvin from Ipsos, who's presenting on understanding patient experience and introduction to the GP patient survey and NHS patient survey program. Um, so Eileen is an associate director at Ipsos. She sits within the Ipsos health team and survey research method center, focusing on developing, sharing and implementing methodological learning. She specializes in high quality, large scale mixed method surveys, working on projects with results that are used as official statistics and in national assessment frameworks. So Eileen, how about you? Thank you, and uh, hopefully you can you can see my slides um, and not my notes, and uh, and we can get get started. So good. fantastic. Um, so uh, thank you for, for listening to this today. Um, I'm going to be introducing you to a couple of surveys. Um, so the GP Patient Survey and the NHS Patient Survey Program, um, and I think they're both long running, self complete uh, survey programs which have really come into their own during the pandemic, as they have long running trends to analyze. Um, and don't need to change method uh, due, to, due to the pandemic. So you can re really measure those, those differences. I'm also aware it's going to be a bit of a whistle stop tour. So the slides are available and they do include links for more information, but obviously um, happy to answer questions at the end. So we're gonna talk through what do we mean by patient experience surveys? What are the surveys? And a bit about the method, the data and how we can use it. And then a bit about um, where the data is accessible. So what do we mean by patient experience? Um, so when we talk about patient experience surveys, we're talking about people's entire journey through health services, including some self-reported outcomes that mainly focus on what happened during the engagements with health services, which can have a real impact on, on what happens next. Um, the Beryl Institute defines patient experience as the sum of all interactions shaped by an organization's culture that influence patient perceptions across the continuum of care. So what are the surveys? Well, um, the GP patient survey, it covers engagement with primary care in England, and it's been running since 2007. The main thing to draw attention in both these surveys is the scale. Um, so it takes place annually and we get 750,000 participants each year. And I think last year it was 850,000. Um, so there's, there's a lot of data and you can do a lot of, of analysis there. Um, and GPPS is designed to provide data for every um, eligible practice. Uh, in England, um, which is, is quite, a, quite a scale. Um, the programme is commissioned by NHS England and is used for a variety of activities, including service improvement, evaluation of health inequalities, regulation and policy measurement and development. The other surveys I'm going to be talking about are the NHS Patient Survey Programme, um, which is managed by the Care Quality Commission, and it allows patients and the public to feedback on experiences of secondary care delivery, um, and it covers NHS trusts. Um, so it covers adult inpatient services, maternity, community mental health, paediatric care, and urgent emergency care, and those surveys take place either annually or every other year. 
because of we've got limited time, I'm going to focus today on the maternity survey, which has been running since 2007 and covers the entire journey of maternity care from the first engagement with a health professional about the pregnancy to postnatal care received in the community. Um, but obviously happy to answer questions about any of the other surveys if they are included. So what is the method? Um, so both surveys use a robust and high quality sampling design. Um, GPPS uses a stratified random probability sampling design and maternity is a census of all mothers who give birth in NHS trusts in February. Um, both cover anyone over the age of 16, uh, sorry, 16 or over. Um, and GPPS, you just have to have been registered with your GP practice for the last six months, um, just so you've had enough time to have engaged with, with the practice itself. In terms of mailing strategy, um, the surveys have both changed over the last few years to encourage participants to take part online, which is more cost effective and results in cleaner data. So all changes to the methods were heavily piloted to ensure we understand the impact on the change in contact strategy on how people respond, how many people respond and who responds. Um, and I can talk more about that if people are interested, but um, the CQC, uh, the NHS patient survey programmes in particular, those uh, pilot reports are all available online. The surveys now both use a push to web approach with a combination of login details provided in letters and paper questionnaires. Um, maternity withholds the paper questionnaire until the third mailing, or GPPS provides the paper alongside the login detail at every contact. And that's just to make sure we're getting that spread of people, um, not just those who are online. Because the samples are drawn from health records, we're also able to address all contacts to a named individual and send SMS reminders, which include a direct link to the survey. And from this, um, GPPS has a response rate of 36%, with 37% taking part online as of last year. And the maternity survey um, has an adjusted response rate of 52%, up from 39% in 2019, with 89% taking part online. And that, that big jump was due to the change in, in mode to encourage people to take part online. In terms of materials, um, we try and use a kind of very similar approach. So both surveys use uh, have paper questionnaires, um, covering letters with link to the online survey um, and text messages. And we try and make sure those feel like a cohesive uh, case of contact strategy. So people recognise that they're being contacted about the same survey. Um, and for maternity, it's a very similar picture using that same sort of style of design. The maternity survey um, also uses posters um, to tell people about the survey before it happens. Um, so in maternity wards during the sampling months, um, posters are put up with details about the survey and mothers aged 16 and 17 are given a specific leaflet to give them a bit more information about the survey and allow them to opt out before being contacted. Um, we also offer the surveys in a variety of accessibility formats, particularly because of the scale of the surveys. We are, even when a small proportion of people respond uh, using additional languages, actually, because of the scale, we're still talking thousands of, of people. So um, both surveys are offered in additional languages online, nine for maternity and 14 for GPPS, as well as via a telephone helpline, which, offers, um, which also offers language options. GPPS is also offered online in BSL videos. Both surveys can be requested in Braille and large print and maternity can be requested in easy read. The online survey also has accessibility options, including adjustable font size, background colors and reviews for screen reader compatibility. Um, and that's something we continue to work on. Um, and those accessibility options are advertised in the maternity survey in a sort of separate little um, piece of paper that goes in to all of the mailing packs. Um, and in GPPS, it's on the back of the letters with uh, notes in the languages that are being offered. Um, and that's just what the uh, adjustable uh, online tool looks like. So what can the data tell us? Um, well, GPPS covers a kind of a range of experiences with primary care, making appointments, experience of appointments out of hours, dentistry as well. Um, use of digital tools and long term conditions, frailty and support and a wide range of demographics. Um, so deprivation, age, ethnicity, uh, gender, sex and trans status, disability, working status. Um, all of those things are available. Um, so you can really look at those health inequalities um, and the maternity survey, as I said, covers that full range right through from antenatal care through to the early stages of infant feeding. 
Um, and again, a wide range of demographics, um, including sort of the demographics of the mother, but also things like whether they've had a baby before, um, whether or not they were induced and what the mode of labour was. Um, so how can we use this data? Um, there are three main ways we use the data. One is understanding change over time. They have very long uh, time series for, for many of their questions. Um, we do really aim to maintain trends, um, but obviously we do keep them up to date to ensure they reflect policy. So for example, with the pandemic, new questions were added to reflect things like remote appointments. In terms of health inequalities, there's a large range of demographics, local area statistics, detailed sample information for the NHS survey programme. Um, so there's lots of information that can be drawn on and look at those differences. And looking at different um, organisations, they're both designed so that you can look either at um, individual trust experience or individual practice experience and then build that up to, for example, ICS areas. Um, so I'm going to take you through a few studies very quickly. Sorry. Oh, you have two minutes. <laughs> um, so uh, looking at maternity data over time, what it told us was that feeding support really dropped during the pandemic, both during pregnancy, which you can see on this slide, um, but particularly during antenatal care. And what we saw was a reduction in exclusive breast milk feeding in the first few days. It's obviously a key health policy. Uh, with GPPS, um, we also looked at people experiencing isolation. Um, and what we found was that varied quite drastically between groups, um, as well as increasing during the pandemic. And um, so younger groups who'd always experienced more isolation um, were also more likely to, to report it increasing. Um, also those who were young carers, people with long-term conditions, particularly mental health, autism and learning disability. Um, and you can also look at uh, different trusts. So in terms of accessing the data, um, top level data is available on the website. Um, the GPPS survey also has an analysis tool where you can play with the data online and new data, uh, the New Year's data is coming out later this week. So uh, worth checking that out. Um, but if you want to do more detailed analysis, the respondent level data is available via the UK data catalogue or um, if you request it. Thank you. <laughs> Right. Thank you very much, Shelley. Very, very interesting presentation and clearly a really, really useful, important um, data sets as well. All right, um, let's make a start of our second session. Um, so this session focuses on the updates to the longitudinal studies, so covering um, Understanding Society, British Cohort Studies and also ELSA. We have three presentations coming up and we're doing the questions slightly differently this time. So um, all of the presenters will go first and then we will have uh, 15 minutes for combined Q&A at the end. So for, without further ado, we'll make a start with uh, Mina Kumari uh, from the Institute for Social and Economic Research talking about understanding society and what has been going on in the past year. Uh, Mina is a professor of biological and social epidemiology. She's a leading expert in biomarkers and genetics and has worked to apply insights from these areas to better understand ageing, cardiovascular disease and health inequalities using Whitehall to cohort study and of, of British civil servants and the ELSA. And Mina is the topic champion for health and biomarker content and research and understanding society and leads research on the biological interface and genetic epidemiology as an investigator for the study. So over to you, Mina. So I'm going to talk to you about um, understanding society. I will go, I will do a sort of overview of the study for those of you that might not know it um, and then I'll talk a little bit about what we did during the uh, pandemic and then if there's time a little bit on next steps I suspect there might not be but okay so understanding society is one of ESRC's key investments it's a survey of um, individuals and it's representative of the UK population it's a household panel study. So uh, we started with a randomly selected sample of households. It's a clustered stratified population sample. And um, we interview everybody in the home. Um, it's kind of similar to a number of household panel studies um, internationally. Um, there's equivalents in the US, in Germany, uh, Australia, and New Zealand. Um, the sample is actually composed of four or five different uh, subgroups, really. So we've got a general population sample, um, 
and uh, we've got an ethnic minority booth sample, so uh, 26,000 people from uh, the general population, 4,000 households um, with at least one individual from an ethnic minority background. Uh, we started in 2009, um, and that was our wave one, and in uh, we incorporated the British Household Panel Survey, which was a similar st study that started in 1991. So we incorporated um, participants from, from that survey um, from wave two. And then we have a set of people that we do, uh, that we use for um, methodological innovation. And then recently, well, five recently, 2015 and 16, we added a new immigrant and ethnic minority boost. So that's people who were born outside of the UK. So um, not just sort of the established ethnic minority boost, uh, ethnic minority people, but um, also sort of Eastern European and other um, ethnic minority groups. We, as I said, we interview, um, we collect information from everybody in the household. So we interview people aged 16 and over. We also we do a, a collect a self-completion from um, children aged between 10 and 15, and then we collect information about children under the age of 10 from parents and guardians. So we've got uh, lots of kind of current information, and then there are some retrospective elements to the, to, to the um, information that we collect from the participants. In terms of health and well-being, we interview people and um, we ask lots of different types of information. So uh, every year we ask about chronic conditions, we ask about um, health conditions, we um, collect mental health information from our participants every year. So we have annual information collected on things like the general health questionnaire, which is a measure of psychological distress or mental health functioning. We've got SF12 on people every year. So there's some information that we collect every single year, health, smoking, for example, is collected every single year. And then um, early in the survey, we collected some objective data. So um, we uh, interviewed our participants and then asked them if a nurse could come and visit them and then we collected um uh we did a nurse visit on 20 20 000, approximately 20,000 participants so we've height and weight lung function grip strength we collected a blood sample and with that we um we measured sort of 21 different analytes we've got a few more online coming soon um using up the blood samples that were collected and then we extracted DNA and we've got a genetic um, resource that's available for um, if you want to use it. In terms of um, we've there's been a lot of talk today about um, mental health and well-being um, so these are the sorts of information that we collect um, with respect to that as I said we in to view the participants every year and we collect the general health questionnaire every year from them. We, we have lots of information about uh, satisfaction in different domains um, and then we do this uh, at Edinburgh Warwick um, positive wellbeing scale and we act collect that intermittently. Um, for the children, we collect information about a kind of happiness in different aspects of their life um, every year. And we do collect the strength and difficulties questionnaire. Earlier on, there was some mention that um, there isn't a continuous measure of um, mental health in children. Um, but we, we do have um, the strength and difficulties questionnaire um, asked every other year from the children as they move through from 10 to 10 to 15 um, and so we do have that information from before the pandemic um, we are extending the content um, in the survey so we do, do we do we are doing de developing a lot of work in terms of harvesting information um, and linking with other data sources we um, consent the participants to link to other types of data, so um, HMRC. We have consented the participants to link to health records. Um, we do things like uh, scraping websites so we've got, we can get an idea of house value and that sort of thing from Zoopla and that we're sort of working on sort of adding or uh, supplementing the data that we've got in addition to the questionnaire and other information that we collect from our participants. We keep, we keep a long core longitudinal kind of consistency. We sort of have to 
stay the same as we, one of the features of doing a longitudinal survey is that you have to think about uh, keeping these the same so that we can uh, monitor how things are changing in people's lives as the world is changing. But we do think about adapting the content and making sure that it remains relevant. So over the period uh, since 2019, we've added content around things like gig working or the use of mobile devices. So we now know who has devices, who has smartphones, those kinds of things. Um, we've added or, or done some work on adding questions on food security. We think about you know environmental interaction. So there is a constant sort of keeping up or trying to maintain relevant um, in the survey while keeping the longitudinal consistency. We have been thinking about and doing lots of sort of innovative work on um, new ways of collecting data. So we ran the IP in the IP12 in one of the innovation panel years. We did some work on um, how we could um, have people collect biomeasures themselves and we're tr working on trying to get that rolled out into the uh, main survey subject to funding. And the study and what served us really well before going into the pandemic is that the innovation team had done quite a lot of work on thinking about um, what we would do in terms of if an event happened, how we could um, adapt the survey um, in the face of that event and modify content and think about how to, to make things happen so that we could do that work. Um, one of the features of um, understanding society is that we started off as a face-to-face -face survey and over time we've we've become more web-based and so we already had quite a lot of um, knowledge about how to sort of do that and who um, would would be open to um, web survey and so that stood us in really good stead when we when the pandemic happened in that we could um, we were kind of ready and, and able to um, adapt the way that Understanding Society was working and add lots of information to the to the survey um, uh, to, 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 to help us sort of really understand what we could what we could do in terms of um, asking uh, what was happening to participants um, during the pandemic. So uh, we did that, uh, we um, have administered a COVID survey. Um, we started in April, 2020, and we went monthly until July, 2020, and then bi-monthly from September, 2020 to March, 2021. And then we did a final interview in September, 2021. So that means that you can draw on the information that all of that information that we had collected before the pandemic and um, use it to, to examine change. Um, the uh, first interview um, sample eligibility conditions, are, uh, uh, you can see them, the participants, we interviewed um, every uh, participant who were age 16 and older, and um, the people who had taken part in one of the last two ways of the survey. Um, and then as the survey developed, we, um, we kind of ad adapted sort of eligibility criteria. So um, uh, from, so we actually conducted nine interviews altogether from the fifth interview onward, for example, um, people have had to have con uh, completed a partial interview in the previous web survey. Um, as, I'm, as I said earlier, it was suggested that there isn't a sort of continuous collection of um, mental health measures in children, but in fact, we conducted three, we collected SDQ, the Strength and Difficulties Questionnaire, three times during the during this period um, from, from our children. So we did it in July, um, in uh, November, November, and in... Um, we did it in July, November, and um, again in March, I think, yes, in March 2021. Um, so we have change from before the pandemic and what was happening to children during the pandemic, if you want to have a look at those data in the study. Right, here you go. So um, these, this is the sample size and response rates for the first two waves. So we collected in April and May to start off with. And as you can see, the it was um, mentioned earlier on that you'd expect in a web survey response rates to be about 20, 25%. And we got a 40% response rate, which is what you'd, I think you might 
um, which is a little bit higher, but I think we're similar to all of the surveys that were being collected at the time. And uh, so, so, so we did well on it. And as we went through, we, we were sort of getting, we started off with about uh, six, 17,000 participants and um, that sort of 13,000, 12,000 number maintained all the way through with these web surveys. What we did in the first um, interview was that we followed up with a telephone survey for some of our participants um, just to see if we could uh, fill back where there might be people who couldn't do the web survey or weren't willing to. And you can see that. You can see that um, the content in April that we administered by telephone does, we did get slightly different profile of participants who did the telephone interview than did the um, web interview. What, what we've done is provided you with these data and provided you with weight to help you kind of get back to population level inference with the, with the study. And so, um, uh, so, so that there's a way of doing that and we've provided the longitudinal weights and you can go to our website and get um, sort of guidance on how to do all of that analysis. I've just drawn it out for you here in terms of if you're interested in the main study, we carried on with the main study while doing the um, doing these web doing this additional web content, um, uh, COVID content with the participants. So the if you're interested in the main survey, the the wave that um, has doesn't overlap at all with um, the pandemic period is wave nine. Um, in the final few months of wave 10, we kind of hit the pandemic period and wave 11 and wave 12 were collected during the pandemic period. Um, as uh, well, we're still in the pandemic period really, um, but but this is sort of how, how it looks if you're thinking about the pandemic. Um, what we did, we, Normally, Mina, sorry, you only have a minute or two left. So okay, just, I've only got a, a quick of, I've only got a couple of <laughs> exercises. So what we did was we provided people with a um, a 2019 file. So if you want to compare to the year before, kind of the pandemic, um, there is a 2019 file available to you um, uh, in the. Uh, um, at the in the archive, so you can go and get that. But it doesn't have everybody in because we take slightly longer than um, a year or two years to collect um, from from all of our participants. Um, and we've made available on the on our website this sort of dashboard, which where you can see what happened to various different um, variables um, during this collection and in the and in the um, uh, as part of this uh, set of data. So these data are um, uh, treatment data, so uh, COVID symptoms. I'm not going to um, go over these at all, but just to say that there was a, the, the data have been used extensively. There's lots and lots of outputs from the, the, the file and um, you, can, you can go to our website and, and find what has been done with the, um, with the different, all of the different types of data that were collected during the pandemic. We're also part of the LLC consortium, and I won't go into that because I'm running out of time. But um, these are the sorts of websites and various other things that you can, you can, are the places you can go to to find out more information about the data, or you can email me. Um, so I'm going to finish now. So it's okay. A really interesting presentation, and thank you so much for flagging about the children's mental health data as well. We'll definitely be be looking at that as well. Um, right, so next we have a presentation from Richard Silverford from the Centre for Longitudinal Studies on the British uh, cohort studies. Um, Richard is, is an Associate Professor of Statistics and Chief Statistician at the UCL Centre for Longitudinal Studies. His applied research is mainly within the context of health, in particular the causes and consequences of non-communicable diseases, often taking a life course perspective. Um, he also has methodological interests, including approaches for handling missing data, the analysis of linked survey and administrative data, and making causal inferences from observational data. So over to you, Richard. Thank you very much for the introduction. Sorry, let me just share my slides. Uh, okay, hopefully you've got that. Um, so thanks very much for inviting me to speak about the um, health data that we have in the CLS cohort studies. Um, so I'm going to try and speak um, about seven different studies here. So that's four ongoing core CLS cohort studies, plus briefly mention another three um, studies that we're just setting up. 
Um, and so I've only got 15 minutes. I, I'm afraid I'm going to have to be quite brief on a lot of areas and not go into any detail. But I've tried to signpost where there's other resources available uh, to find out more and obviously happy to answer any questions either here or later on. So first of all, just briefly, what do we do at CLS? So we're an ESRC funded resource centre uh, based within the UCL Social Research Institute. Uh, we run currently four major national longitudinal studies. So each of these are following thousands of people across life. Um, and then we, we uh, observe them at regular points in time, collecting extensive and rich data. Part of our role is also to provide free data to the research community. Um, and this is often via the UK data service. Um, so we prepare our data, deposit it, make it available, then provide extensive documentation, guidance, and also training for using the data appropriately. Um, we also welcome researcher inputs onto the data that we collect. So in advance of each wave of data collection within each study, uh, we'll run consultations, usually in person and online, uh, to try and find out you know, the, the sorts of uh, data that it would be useful for researchers to collect. We also conduct our own research, and this is really multidisciplinary. So there's people from all sorts of disciplines across health and social research and both substantive and methodological. So because we're collecting the data ourselves, we're interested in survey methodological research to sort of optimize what we're doing. Uh, and then because we're analyzing the data ourselves and advising others on doing so, we're interested on statistical methodological research too. So the four cohorts, main cohorts that we run, um, all contain at least 16,000 individuals at initiation. Um, so the National uh, Child Development Study at the top is um, a nationally representative study, uh, including all children born in one single week in 1958 across all of Great Britain. The British Birth Cohort Study, similarly, um, all births in one week in 1970 across Great Britain. Next Steps was um, only recruited when they were age 14 in 2004, so they correspond to births in um, between 1989 and 1990. And then the Millennium Cohort Study, and sorry, Next Steps only covers uh, England, and then the Millennium Cohort Study is births, oh sorry, a sample of births um, between 2000 and 2002 across all of the UK. And we also work closely with colleagues at the MRC Unit for Lifelong Health and Aging at UCL, where the um, National Survey for Health and Development, uh, the 1946 both birth cohort, is based. So this um, plot here, I quite like. It shows us where we've um, made data collections on each of these studies. So we can see, maybe looking at next steps first, that we don't have any of these dots representing data collection in the first 14 years of life, because they were only recruited at that age. Then they were observed every year for the next few years, and then less regularly after age 20. Across all the other studies, the other three, we observe them from birth at fairly regular intervals throughout um, their life. And we can see the, the sort of ages that they're at at the moment. So NCDS are now into their 60s. So really they're, I guess, working towards retirement or thinking about extending their, their working life. BCS 70 uh, into their 50s. So I guess into, into later midlife. Next steps in their 30s. So really thinking about, um, you know, topics such as career trajectories and, and starting families and probably home ownership uh, and MCS in their 20s. So really kind of continuing education, starting out on their careers and probably leaving home. So this is the, the typical information that we tend to cover in each of these cohort studies. It's fairly similar across them. Um, and when it's not, then we've got some ongoing programs of data harmonization, where we try and identify um, where data have been collected similarly across cohorts and make it more similar if that's possible. So I won't dwell on this because really the focus is on health today, um, but just, I guess, some of the, the key things in, in birth, we're interested in parental characteristics, the birth itself, any issues with that. Um, in childhood, we're interested about the kind of the home environment, education, what's going on in school, what's going on outside of school, uh, and then transitions into adulthood, so educational employment transitions once they're into adulthood, um, partnership formations, starting families, um, employment, and then there's some common threads all the way through. We're thinking about, you know, health, cognition, 
mental health as well as physical health. And some of these things are observed at, at many points in time and often using similar sorts of instruments, which allow us to construct kind of more longitudinal um, trajectories, I suppose. Uh, here's just a, a few examples of the, the many different analyses that have been taken using, uh, sorry, been undertaken using data from across the CLS cohorts. So I think maybe one or two would just be using cross-sectional data, but in the majority of cases, um, people would be using the, the longitudinal nature of these cohort studies to answer their questions. Sometimes, as I say in a second ago, um, they're using the kind of repeated measures that we have to construct life course trajectories. Um, and then most of these, I think, are kind of single cohort analyses, but increasingly we're seeing more um, cross cohort work. So it allows you to make, um, to try and investigate how things are changing across time and between cohorts. So how the, I guess, the levels of things or the associations between things change over time. So what's the, the current state of play in, our, in terms of our data collections? Um, so starting from the bottom in NCDS, the, I guess, age, 20, age 62 in inverted commas um, sweep of data collection actually started pre-pandemic in 2020, um, had to be suspended due to the pandemic restarted towards the end of last year. And so we're hoping to complete in spring of next year. The age 51 BCS 70 data collection was delayed due to the pandemic again, started um, towards the end of last year, and we're hoping to, to finish that early next year. Next Steps um, has just started recently, and again, hopefully finishing early next year. So we can see it's a very busy time at the moment for our, um, for our survey team, because we've got three of these big studies out in the field. MCS have got uh, their next data collection, which should be starting next year, uh, completing the following year. So the majority of um, the waves of data collection across the, the CLS studies um, are undertaken you know, using a kind of standard um, survey approaches, a lot of the time in person, or you know, increasingly for some sweeps, we're getting more online or um, telephone modes of data collection. But there's been a, a few specific um, biomedical data collections where we're trying to specifically to, to um, capture information um, within this area. So there's two in NCDS, including uh, the one that's currently out in the field, and one in BCS at age 46, which we'll look at in a bit more detail on the next slide. So there's lots of opportunities, um, perhaps not always um, realised, given the number of opportunities that are, that are available using these biomedical data, in both single cohort analyses and uh, in cross cohort analyses, thinking about trends in health and trends in the determinants and consequences of health. Um, so this is the BCS 70 age 46 biomedical sweep. And the other biomedical data collections are, are broadly similar. So there's some questionnaire data collection around um, household composition, relationships, finances, um, and employment. And then the focus is really on here, the um, health, well-being, and condition uh, and cognition section within the questionnaire, as well as additional nurse measures that were taken in person. So there's lots of information on physical and mental health, mental well-being, medical care, medication, um, health behaviors, and then some cognitive function tests, trying to tap into immediate and delayed memory, executive function, and concentration and attention to detail. Um, the nurse measures are, kind of, I guess, standard measures of anthropometry and um, some physical function measures around grip and balance, blood, blood pressure, taking blood uh, samples for, for later assaying, uh, and then accelerometry data over a seven day period um, with an online diet questionnaire as well. So there's lots of rich data here that you can imagine being used in, in a variety of different ways and in fact have been used um, across many different analyses. We also have um, now, and really a lot of this has happened over the last couple of years, um, an extensive uh, selection of linked um, administrative data in the cohort. So both health data is set out here and other linked administrative data sets. Um, so in England, we have um, linked uh, all of our studies, apart from MCS, although you see at the bottom that that's coming soon, into hospital episode statistics, uh, which come in, in four separate files. Um, I won't go into the details of each of these, but they're, you know, they're all available. They're kind of, they're available over different periods of time, which is one thing that you need to be aware of. And that also differs 
by the study as well as the um, HES data set. And these are available via the Secure Lab at UKDS. Um, in Scotland, we've got all of the studies linked into the Scottish medical records. So recall, I hopefully said that Next Steps was England only, so you won't see that included um, in the Scotland and Wales linked health admin data. Um, so SMR, we've got um, you know, some of these, these um, modules of records are linked into all the studies, and then others are only linked into those where relevant. Again, these are available at UKDS. Um, and in Wales, we've got some MCS linkage, either available um, from the SAIL data bank, or also some hospitalisation and diagnoses from ICD-10 chapter codes uh, available from UKDS. Um, and there's some upcoming, so at the moment the HES data are only available up to 2017, but there's an, an upcoming refresh of that, bringing it more up to date, and that will include COVID-19 data for the cohort members. Um, we also have lots of genetic data increasingly available, so I think currently available for NCDS and MCS, uh, MCS because it's uh, a study which also includes data collection on other family members, we often have um, genetic data available on the cohort member, the mother and the father, which I understand allows you to do some, some interesting things with genetic analyses. Um, BCS70 genotyping underway at the moment, so those data should be available soon. And in next steps, we're collecting uh, saliva samples as part of the current sweep of data collection, so looking for funding to extract DNA and genotype those soon. Um, a couple of kind of projects in this area currently underway. Um, there, we're working on a single quality control data set for the NCDS genetic data, which should be available soon, so people don't have to undertake that work themselves each time. Um, and also a program of work generating polygenic risk scores for multiple phenotypes, I think probably starting in NCDS, but then across um, the studies, and again, those should be available soon. We've recently uh, changed the system for applying to access the genetic data, um, so it should be a, a quicker response with a, a simple form. So hopefully, um, if you're interested, then the link is there if you're interested in that. Um, we've also undertook COVID-19 surveys. So when the pandemic um, struck, obviously we've got these ongoing cohort studies. And we realized quickly that if we collected additional um, COVID-19 data, then this would provide a, a very useful resource for the research community. So that's across the four CLS cohorts I've been talking about, plus the 1946 birth cohort as well. So these are a, a wide range of, range of ages at the start of the um, pandemic. So it provides a lot of information across a broad range of the, uh, of the population. Uh, three waves of data collection between 2020 and 2021 with the sorts of topics that you might imagine from a, a kind of COVID focused survey, thinking about people's home life, their employment, their health, their experience of the pandemic, particularly around um, mental health. And again, these data are available. And then as part of this, we've also been contributing to the national core studies. So kind of harmonized analyses across a large number of nationally representative or UK um, longitudinal studies. Um, we've also collected some serology data. So participants in the COVID surveys were invited to um, provide blood samples by return of males. So we've got antibody um, results from those tests for over 10,000 blood samples that were returned in um, early 2021. And then I'm going to try and very quickly do one slide on each of these studies. Sorry, a bit ambitious. Uh, so these are three new cohorts that CLS are involved in to um, kind of varying degrees. The first one of these is the early life cohort feasibility study. Um, so this has started last year, and I think we're, we're yet to recruit, um, testing the feasibility of a new UK-wide birth cohort study, um, recruiting several thousand babies at, at this stage, collecting information about their families and their development. Um, and really the feasibility part here is because we're looking at quite innovative methods of uh, sort of sample frame definition, recruitment, um, and data collection. So we're looking to see if we can improve in some of these areas with the hope that it will be rolled out more broadly in the next couple of years. Um, so the, the study co-directors include uh, Alyssa and Lisa from CLS, as well as uh, Pascal Firon. 
Children of the 2020s There's another nationally representative birth cohort, this one commissioned by the DfE. So the questions are probably more, uh, as you would expect, aligned to their interests around family, early education, childcare determinants of early school success. Um, I think this sample is partially or, or fully drawn now in the way suggested there. Uh, five waves, I think one and three are face to face. The remaining ones are sequential mixed mode and some again some innovative methods to data collection including using apps that parents would use to record childhood milestones and, and other things in kind of real time so pasco is leading on that again and then finally cosmo the covid social mobility and opportunities survey this is uh, recruiting older students so twelve thousand of them those who are in year 11 in their last academic year so the, those who've been really badly affected by school closures and other restrictions over that over the pre previous two years so this is answering some important questions about who's been particularly affected by the, this disruption what inequalities are there there how long term are those um, are those inequalities wave one data already collected and will actually be available quite soon and second wave coming up in the near future lots of different individuals and bodies involved uh, in this one with the pi being jake anders from the ucl center for education policy and equalizing opportunities lots more information on those three studies available on either the cls website or in this case the ucl website thank you very much Thank you very much, Richard, and, and really interesting and so much going on as well. So, um, yeah, really a challenge to fit it into 15 minutes, isn't it? <laughs> um, I'm now going to hand over to Alexandra Lee, who's going to tell us about Elsa Wave 10 changes and adaptations. Alexandra is a researcher in the Longitudinal Service team at NATSEN, where she predominantly works on the Elsa which follows the lives of people in England age 50 and over. And prior, prior to joining NATSEN, she worked as a research assistant at the University of Manchester on a mixed method project, exploring international education policy and outcomes. So over to you, Alexandra. Thanks, Mary. I'm just going to share my screen. Um, so yeah, um, as Mary said, thank you for introducing me and thank you for um, yeah, allowing me to speak today. Um, I'm going to be talking to you today about um, the English Longitudinal Study of Aging or ELSA and the changes and adaptations that we've made to the 10th week of field work. So today I'll start by giving you a brief background of the study and then I'll talk to you about COVID-19 and the impact of it and how we adopted um, computer assisted video interview or CAVI as the mode to enable data collection during the pandemic. And then I'll speak to you about the adaptations that were made to wave 10 of ELSA, followed by the approach to code in prescribed medicines and also the accelerometry module where respondents wear activity monitors to record physical activity levels. So the English Longitudinal Study of Aging, or ELSA, is a study of people aged 50 and over and their partners. And we know it as ELSA, but it's also known on the doorstep and in the logo as 50, uh, ELSA 50 Plus Health and Life. And the study began in 2002, and it aims to interview the same group of people every two years to explore the health, lifestyles and financial situations of people as they grow older. And every four years, we also have a nurse visit. And the aim is to create a picture of what it means to age in England and to understand the reasons behind any changes in people's lives. And ELSA is modelled on the Health and Retirement Study, or HRS, which is run in the US. And it's carried out, um, well, ELSA is carried out out by NATSEN in collaboration with University College London, the Institute for Fiscal Studies, the University of Manchester and the University of East Anglia. And we're currently undertaking field work for Wave 10. And the Wave 10 Elsa Capi interview, um, so this is the face-to-face -face, um, and the video interview, and there's been a few um, module changes that I'll talk to you about a bit later on, um, but these are the different modules that we have within the interview. And the content is similar to previous waves, but there have been um, some tweaks to different modules um, just due to the pandemic, such as the health module, for instance, where we've added questions on COVID-19 and vaccination 
pensions, for example, and also in the work and pensions modules where we've added furlough questions, for example. And the self-completion questionnaire, so you can see this on the bottom right of the screen, so the last module that's um, mentioned here. And this is actually a paper questionnaire that is completed by the respondent separately to their interview with an interviewer. And this just allows privacy for some more personal questions rather than being asked in the interview. So Wave 10 fieldwork was due to launch in April 2020, but face-to-face -face fieldwork was put on hold due to the pandemic. And as a result, we explored alternative modes of data collection on ELSA. And historically, ELSA has adopted a face-to-face -face or CAPI, so computer-assisted personal interview approach. However, this was not possible during the pandemic. And as there was an increased use of video calling tools developed and made accessible during the pandemic, this made computer-assisted video interviewing or CAVI more accessible so we could conduct video interviews. And the 1970 British Cohort Study, um, also known as BCS70, which um, Richard has spoken about already today, um, so which is run by the Centre for Longitudinal Studies or CLS, and this, um, this successfully adopted a CAVI approach in its pilot, where it had a response rate of 76%, uh, 76% sorry. and as such we adopted um, a CAVI approach on ELSA as well in the Wave 10 pilot, which just allowed us to make progress during the pandemic, um, where we wouldn't have otherwise been able to make any progress. And here we had a response rate of 31%. And we received really positive feedback from interviewers um, in the approach and incorporated their feedback into the main stage CAVI tranches. Um, and these CAVI, um, yeah, these CAVI interviews finished in March 2022, and we had a 32% response rate for main stage. But due to our sample consisting of people aged 50 plus, many of whom don't have access to or aren't comfortable with the technology required for CAVI interviews, we also offered respondents the, um, the option to opt in for a face-to-face -face interview at a later date, um, where we expect to achieve a response rate of 83% overall among existing sample members. And after we started um, CAVI fieldwork in October 2021, we were able to move back to face-to-face -to -face interviewing again earlier this year in March and we are currently three of the fifths um, yeah three fifths of the way through field work now um, however respondents do still have the option to have a video interview if that is what they would prefer and some adaptations were made to the Wave 10 interview content to ensure that all questions were applicable to a CAVI interview. And as such, show cards were shown to the participant using screen share during the video interview, which include additional information, such as a list of categories, um, for example, um, for sensitive questions where the interviewer um, or the respondent may not feel comfortable with the questions or answers being read out loud, or also consent information that the participant can read through um, during the interview um, in their own time rather than having it read to them and this just ensures that the participants still had access to all of the information that they needed for the interview and in addition to this um, the paper self-completion questionnaires that I spoke about at the beginning were sent in advance and sent back to the respondent um, before the interview where previously they were provided during the interview by the interviewer. And then finally, the consent to data linkage process was also amended. So previously, um, we obtained written consent um, through forms, and this process um, was amended for video interviews to incorporate the questions into the interview, where the respondent could then consent or um, refuse consent during the interview, and that's recorded as a question. And it's yeah, it's now recorded verbally, and their response is recorded in the interview and fed forward to future waves so that we can check this um, in the future. And this process has worked really well and has been continued in face-to-face -face interviews in wave 10 and in future waves. And we found that on ELSA, video interviews are technic technically feasible. However, it was important to amend certain parts of the interview, as mentioned previously, just to ensure that certain as aspects weren't lost. And some components of the interview worked really well, despite the concerns, such as the cognitive function module, where the respondent is asked a series of interactive questions to assess their mental capacity. However, other modules were not possible, such as the measurements module, for example, where weight um, is taken and a timed walk is 
is carried out. And we found that in ELSA, response rates were lower in video interviews than in face-to-face -face interviews from previous waves. This was predicted due to the sample of people aged 50 plus. Um, however, it did allow us to make progress when it would not have other otherwise been possible. And um, we have gone back to a face-to-face -face approach now that um, the pandemic permits us to do so. Um, so, um, it's just worth bearing that in mind as well. And interviewers also require technical training before commencing video interviews. However, we also received really positive feedback from some respondents and interviewers who preferred the convenience of video interviews. And we also discovered that concurrent interviews are possible using CAVI, um, where respondents are interviewed um, both at the same time using the same device. And one of the main changes to the Wave 10 interview content is the prescribed medicine coding aspect, which is a module of questions about prescribed medications and over-the-counter statins. And previously, this information was coded by nurses using a paper booklet as part of the nurse visit. However, the nurse visit in Wave 10 was postponed to Wave 11 um, just due to the pandemic. So as such, this part of the study was moved into the main interview that's conducted by an interviewer. So currently, interviewers record medications using a lookup table in the CAPI questionnaire and the interviewer uses a lookup table to type in the name of the medication, the dosage and the medication type, so whether it's a tablet, caplet um, and so forth. And then they select um, from a list to assign the um, BNF code to the British National Formulary Code and previously nurses only collected this information from core members. Um, however, this change allows the module to be asked of both core members and their partners. And this is the first study that has adopted this approach of um, interviewers coding medications using a lookup table during the interview. And the approach has been developed and adopted for other studies with similar modules. And the module was designed in collaboration with the Natsen Biomedical Centre alongside the ELSA collaborators, both of whom have expertise in this area. And we also received positive feedback from interviewers from their experiences during the pilot. And there were no changes needed for the main stage interview as it worked really well. And out of approximately 13,000 possible medicines that can be coded, as of this week, only 79 medicines were not coded using the lookup and instead were recorded using a free text response. And of these, um, of these 79 responses, 34 could be back coded using the coding frame and 29 need further clarific um, clarification on from collaborators, but we should still be able to code following this clarification. And the remaining 16 um, of these 79 were entered incorrectly or did not have um, sufficient information for us to be able to back code them. So, so far, this shows that the changes are working really well as so few medicines that have not been, um, have not been able to be coded using the lookup. And then um, the activity monitor module or accelerometry module is a new addition to wave 10. And this aims to measure the physical activity levels of participants using, um, using activity monitors um, that are a bit like a watch. And they're worn for eight consecutive days and nights. And those who are eligible and willing to participate will be sent an activity monitor and a wrist strap, along with the instructions on how to wear and return the monitor. And respondents receive an incentive of five pounds for taking part once the monitor has been um, returned to the office and they're also sent their results and 75% of households are eligible for this module where data are collected from both core members and their partners and measure, um, yeah, measuring physical activity is really challenging because self-reported information tends to be inaccurate. So activity monitors allow us to objectively measure participants' physical activity levels. And it's important to measure, uh, measure physical activity as research has shown that lifestyle factors, such as the amount of um, time people uh, sorry, spend being active or the time spent being inactive and the types of activity that they do have an important impact on their health. And we've added a question to the interview to determine whether the respondent is happy to participate in this module. And if they agree, they're sent a monitor, a wrist strap, a leaflet and a free post envelope from the office. And this pack also includes a postcard. Um, and here the respondent can note down the start time and date um, from when the monitor was worn. 
And so far we have a response rate of 82% of respondents who are willing and able to wear a monitor. But please do note that this, um, yeah, this um, is not the final figure as we're currently um, three-fifths of the way through field work and therefore this response rate is subject to change. Um, and respondents are sent feedback plots of their activity levels over the week. And an example of this um, feedback plot is on the screen on the right hand side. And here we can see um, the different types of activity that the participant um, has done over the eight days. So we can see that yellow signifies imputed data. And, and this is um, before the monitor was worn. And this is why that card um, where, the monitor, uh, where the participant jots down the time and date that they started wearing the monitor is really important. Important. Um, and then the green is moderate to vigorous physical activity, where red is sedentary, so where the respondent is resting or just sitting down, for example, and then blue shows sleep. And the black line signifies acceleration, and orange is light activity. Um, so alongside this feedback plot, respondents are also sent a summary letter of their average time per type of activity over, um, over the eight days. So, for example, summarising that they may sleep for an average of eight hours per night. And this is an addition to the feedback plot. But as you can see, this is really rich data and it will be available with the survey, de um, survey data um, upon the completion of Way 10 fieldwork. So thank you for listening to this presentation. Um, I really appreciate your time um, and you can find my contact details on the screen. So please don't hesitate to ask me any questions um, either in the chat or do feel free to get in touch with me using these contact details. Excellent, thank you very much, Alexandra. Um, really a lot of interesting stuff going on on Elsa as well.